Thank you for joining us for this evening's program on the power and beauty of the brain. I'm Chris Sable, Executive Director for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Dale Mosier, our board chair, and the entire Vail Symposium board, welcome. The Vail Symposium has been offering affordable, thought-provoking programming to the Vail community since 1971. Two items to be aware of before we get started. Please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. You can type those in at any time, and we'll get to those later in the program, and we'll get to as many as time permits. The program will run until 7 o'clock. It is being recorded, and the video will be available at veilsymposium.org. I'd like to thank the organizations and individuals who help make the Vail Symposium possible. Our presenting sponsors are the Town of Vail and the Frechette Family Foundation. Our event sponsors are the Vail Daily, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, and the Antlers at Vail. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank, and Cindy Ingalls has underwritten our summer season of programming. Donors at every level make our programming possible. I'd like to thank you all. We're planning 20 programs to take place between now and October, a combination of live and webinar events. The first six programs are currently listed on our website, and we'll announce the next six programs in the coming weeks. Our next program takes place on Tuesday, June 7th, when we host a webinar with author and entrepreneur Bobby Kaler, part of our Purposeful Living series entitled, Am I Showing Up in All the Roles that Matter to Me? Our first in-person event takes place on June 22nd. We're very excited to add a new series to our programming called Conversations on Controversial Issues, moderated by Clay Jenkinson. The topic is the Supreme Court of the United States, and our speakers, Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, Akhil Reed Amar, and Senior Vice President for Legal Studies at the Cato Institute, Clark Neely. We plan to present four programs a year in this new series, and our follow-up follow program will be on August 24th, the topic immigration. Tonight's program focuses on the beauty and power of the brain, and our esteemed experts are Dr. Sue Mortar and Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor is a Harvard-trained and published neuroanatomist whose research specialized in understanding how our brain creates our perception of reality. In 2008, Dr. Jill gave a presentation about her experience with her own stroke at the TED conference in Monterey, California. This was the first TED talk to ever go viral. TED and Dr. Jill became world famous instantaneously, and that TED talk has now been viewed well over 28 million times. This eight minute presentation catapulted Dr. Jill into the public eye, and within six weeks of presenting that talk, she was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. She was the premier guest on Oprah's Soul Series webcast, and her book, My Stroke of Insight, became a New York Times bestseller and remained on the list for 63 weeks. She's passionate about educating the public about the beauty of our human brain, and she is committed to not only helping others find their way back from neurological trauma, but is eager to help everyone better understand their brain so they can live their best lives. Dr. Sue Mortar is an international speaker, master of bioenergetic medicine, and quantum field visionary. She redirects the flow of energy patterns in the body to activate full human potential. Through her seminars, retreats, and presentation, she illuminates the relationships of quantum science and energy medicine, as well as the elevation of human consciousness and life mastery. Her globally taught Energy Codes coursework teaches individuals how to clear subconscious memory blockages and how to master the energetics of their lives. I wanna remind everybody to please ask your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. We've been fortunate to have Dr. Mortar present her work to our community several times over the year. It's my pleasure to welcome her back via this webinar. And Dr. Mortar, I now turn the program over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chris, so much. It is always a joy to be reconnecting with Vale. Vale is uh, not only the symposium, but the mountain itself is very near and dear to my heart. And Vale Village is uh, the town of Vale is such a beautiful presence 
on this planet with so many uh, high quality thinkers and the and the gathering of so many. Uh, it is just a joy to be back here with you again and a real pleasure to be engaging in such a delightful conversation with my friend, uh, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. So Dr. Jill wrote the um, foreword to my book and it has been a wonderful dance in helping humanity ever since. So it's a delight to bring uh, all of this conversation here to you this evening. So thank you again for the invitation. Now, when we begin a conversation about the brain and the beauty of the brain and its ability to process life and its determination of how we interpret and perceive life around us, we, we begin a conversation about who we are as human beings and what it is that this life is truly meant to be for each of us. We are influenced by the things that we encounter and even more so, we're, inter we're, we're influenced by the way that we interpret the things around us that occur. And we interpret the things around us that are occurring through a series of filters and lenses, et cetera. We're going to explore a lot of that this evening in our conversation with you, all of which is directed toward healing and creativity. When I contacted Dr. Jill and said, okay, Jill, what would you love to talk about tonight? She said, I'd really love to talk about healing because at the end of the day, that's what matters most. And to bring people into their wholeness is, has become a real focus for her. Uh, most of you know her by her book, uh, My Stroke of Insight, but she has a new book on the scenes and it is about whole brain living. So we'll be speaking about that and the four characters in the brain that actually are driving our life experience and how that begins to unfold. And so without further ado, I'd like to bring Dr. Jill onto the scene and I'm just gonna kick it off with a question to her so that uh, you can meet her and engage with her right away. So Dr. Jill, I'd love to hear about what happened for you after your book, My Stroke of Insight, that hit the TED Talk and became a tremendous influence for people. I have to say that when I first watched your TED Talk before I even knew you, I could barely sit still because everything that you were saying was activating and illuminating so many things that I had experienced in meditation. And here you were having similar experiences from an entirely different gateway, a different avenue. But I knew that we were on to something that matters extraordinarily much to humanity and is extremely important for us to begin to put into uh, to practicalities. And so I want to ask you what from that moment in your life, what prompted you to write another book that you're now bringing forward and how do the two relate to each other? So let's uh, let's turn it over to Dr. Jill Bote Taylor, everyone. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you for for me being here. I'm so grateful for the invitation. Uh, it is my first time with Vail Symposium, and of course, I always enjoy Dr. Sue. So uh, when it you know when I think about when I think about Dr. Sue, I think about of course energy healing. And when I experienced the stroke, of course, what happened for me was I lost that left hemisphere of my brain. And when I lost the left hemisphere, which is me, the individual, I begin and end at where my skin meets the air. And I perceive myself as an individual separate from it all. When I lost that left hemisphere and shifted into the consciousness of that right hemisphere, then I become that cute little energy feel, uh, figure that, that Dr. Sue always teaches about. And um, of course it was uh, something that happened to me. It wasn't something I was striving to do, but it was the natural experience of losing the left hemisphere and what those cells do, how they organize information and the filter through which information comes in from the present moment into my information processing. So in the absence of that left hemisphere, I shifted, of course, into this consciousness of essentially open, expansive energy as big as the universe. So for me, so so for me, you know, I love talking to Dr. Sue because that's where she functions. And at the same time, of all the people that I know on the planet, uh, we are both biologically based. Um, uh, her training as a chiropractor, my training as a neuroanatomist. So, 
So it's exciting for me to be able to be in conversation with someone who is both the biological anatomical structure of cells and the energy that fuels those cells for us to be these magnificent living beings. So, um, uh, so all of that is to say thank you and thank you, Dr. Sue. Um, as far as, as why did I write Whole Brain Living? I wrote Whole Brain Living because after that TED Talk, um, what that achieved was a awareness and a curiosity and an interest and actually a level of reverence for me be as a scientist who had this experience that a lot of people would frame then as spiritual. Um, but that was a miss for me. I didn't want people to revere me. I wanted people to revere one another. I wanted us to gain this sense of awesomeness of, oh my gosh, we're alive. Each one of us is this magnificent collection of 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses. Each one of us coming from that single cell that differentiates into cells that would see, have vision, cells that would hear, cells that would have motility, cells that could speak, just this magnificent of what we are. And um, my stroke of insight told my story, but it didn't, it didn't land what I wanted landed. And that was this real incredible awareness of what we all are, what each of us is as a magnificent combination of atoms and molecules and energy in cellular form. Mm. Beautiful. So in your experiences of working with individuals that would contact you after you wrote the book. Lots of people I remember contacting you asking about what do I do? I've had a stroke or my mother has had a stroke or, you know, how can we begin to integrate and implement and, and change and heal? And I'm sure that the exposure to the multiple cases that were contacting you, uh, I know that we spoke about uh, many of those and, and we're working with ways that, that people could integrate and implement. I'm sure that that um, began to stir something in you regarding what can I do for others? How can we benefit from now not, you know, having this distinction between right brain and left brain? How can we, how can we utilize these ideas of our wholeness and our fullness and our universal cosmicness? And how can we implement our individuation and our, and our ability to make distinctions and make decisions and be highly functioning? And how can we heal? Um, so, so what did you come to, um, to realize that, that really was the impetus of the topic specifically about whole brain living? What is it about whole brain living that is an answer to those questions that were, that were being begged for so many years after your book was out? Um, so first of all, you know, there are some myths about the brain that people believe that I don't believe at all. One is that we only use 10% of our brain. I completely disagree. Um, neurons are social creatures. They're like human beings in network with other cells. And if it's alive and it's in a network, then you're using it. Um, how, you know, we may not be able to point to every cell and say it does this, it does that, but we actually can point to a whole bunch of cells and, and have a really good idea of what those neurons are actually doing. So I believe that we, if it's alive and it's in your head, you're using it, first of all. And then there is this myth that the right hemisphere is emotional and the left hemisphere is thinking. And that's simply not true either. When you look at the anatomical structure, structure of the human brain, and of course I have for us a little model of a human brain, when you look at the anatomy of the brain, we have two amygdala, two hippocampi, two, two cingulate gyri, which make up the limbic or the emotional system of the brain. So we have emotion in both hemispheres and we have thinking tissue in each hemisphere. And the basic differences between the two hemispheres that I experienced anyway, based on my, my stroke experience, was the left hemisphere has a past, it has a future, and it has an identity. 
excuse me, called me individual Jill Bolte Taylor. But my right hemisphere, it doesn't think like that. It doesn't, it, it, it's all about the present moment experience. So it's the, the emotion or the experience experience what does it feel like to be in the present moment and what are what is my cognition as it is connected to the vastness of all that is and so what i realized was that there's actually four characters well this isn't new news carl jung told you there told us all there were four characters but for carl jung there was one that was conscious the left thinking rational thinking but then the emotion both emotional systems versus also the right thinking tissue was all in part of what he would call the unconscious. And so, you know, the advantage for me as a neuroanatomist to lose my left hemisphere was to realize, well, what's going on in my right hemisphere without the inhibition of that left hemisphere? The disadvantage, of course, was that I lost my left hemisphere. And a part of that left hemisphere is me, the individual, my ability to relate to the external world and my past emotion and my future so, um, you know, we end up with these, these four very distinct characters inside of each one of us based on the neuroanatomy of the brain. And the beauty of that is it says, okay, so, so what are my choices? And it, isn't it nice to say, you know, <laughs> or let, hmm, someone says to you, you know, you couldn't, you have made a better choice. And it's like, well, don't you think if I'd have had a better choice, I'd have made a better choice. And it's like, well, these are actually the better we get to know each of these characters, the better we get to know what our choices are so that we can actually choose moment by moment who and how we want to be so that we can live a pe the, the life we want to live, a life of peace, a life of healing. So, you know, I think that one of the biggest obstacles for humanity is that they don't realize that there is a choice in the moment that they're responding we're in knee-jerk reactivity, we're in survival mode, we are stuck in the primitive brain, we are all about doing the right thing, making sure I don't make a mistake or that I show up the way I'm supposed to or that I live into either the image that I have for myself or the one that, that society has created, that I think society has created for me or that my parents handed down to me or all the variety of things. We're in knee-jerk reactivity, in survivorship. And so just the idea that there's a pause, there is a moment that we could be making a choice about how we respond, about how we engage, about that, the fact that we could even create rather than just be a reactor is kind of phenomenal for a lot of humanity. A lot of people don't realize that that state of presence is even an option. And so when we start to, to realize that this is true, that there is a choice and that we can come to know these qualities or these choices based on these four characters that are alive and well inside of us, as you are uh, depicting, uh, what, is, what is the first thing that you would have someone do to get to know uh, better? How can I choose in this moment based on uh, uh, what I'm learning here in this moment? Uh, well, how can I choose in a way that I'm gonna be really happy with the decision that I made or the choice that I made or the things that I create? So first of all, you know, I always, I'm a neuroanatomist, so I, and I'm a cellular neuroanatomist. I care about the cells. Every ability we have, we have because we have brain cells that perform that function. So our ability to feel fear and have a knee jerk response or to fear, to experience anger and want to lash out or to want to go and run and hide the fight, flight, flee. It's all everything. Every thought we think, every movement we make, every word we speak. Speak, everything is based on brain cells. And I always go back to the fact that I am this mass, this collection of 50 trillion molecular geniuses that are specifically designed to work together as a single whole. And as a single whole, okay, but I have, I have cells that allow me to see and I have ears that allow me to hear. And also at the level of those four, those uh, four major groups of cells, the two emotional groups of cells and the two thinking groups of cells, each of those groups of cells is intra-related. 
And as a result of that, they come out as a certain kind of character. So by getting to know each of my, my four characters, each of the skill sets of these four groups of cells, then I can choose moment by moment, okay, do I want to be in the right here, right now, experiential, excited, adventurous, sharing with you, playful, oh, let's go do something, right? Let's go, let's go big, 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 you know, and we're just right here doing it. Or do I want to sit back and, and be proper and make sure my hair's all correct and make sure my earrings are in? That's a very a different part of who I am. And when I know each of these four characters inside of myself, then in, in any moment, I can do what I call a brain huddle, which is where I call all four characters into the present moment, into conversation with one another, so that it's like, like, okay, in this moment, do I want to react in this way? Do I want to behave in this way? Do I want to come in and fix something? Do I want to come in and be loving and soothing? Do I want to go be playful? Or misery loves miserable company. And man, I can moan and groan with the best of them. <laughs> so how about some examples? If we could give people an understanding of these four characters that are that are residing in their own brain tissues and their and and huddle them up for uh, some specifics, can you give us an example of each of these four characters that uh, all of the participants here, the viewers are uh, are housing? So as we think about that, the brain, let's look at the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And then we're going to divide each one into the thinking tissue and the emotional tissue. So left thinking tissue, this is the part of us that goes to work. This is our rational thinking brain. Uh, this is the part of me that showed up on time. It likes to control people, places, and things. It defines what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. It fits me into the social norm. So so that I can be acceptable in the present moment as I'm having an experience. So it was my character one that got me here in this moment. Character two is me, my emotion. And I have a past and I have a future. So this is all of the emotions from my past. So any positive experiences or any trauma I've had from my past is located inside of that character two, which is the left emotional tissue of my brain. Character three, is going to be three and four are going to be in the right hemisphere. Character three and four, they're just right here right now. It's not about me, the individual. I died on the morning of the stroke. I just existed in the present moment. And character three is the experience of that present moment. What does it feel like to be here? Or how much humidity is in the air? And what does it feel like when I jump into the lake and I feel the pressure against my body and I feel the temperature against my body? What does it feel? like to have the clothing on our on our body how heavy is that necklace around your neck well, how, what does it feel like in the present moment and because it's in the present moment it's right here right now the left hemisphere defines what is right and wrong and good and bad and socially acceptable the right hemisphere just wants to whee, be here right so it may make some good decisions it may make some very poor <laughs> decisions but it's going to be engaged in the present and then character four is the part of us that is simply good with all that is. For gosh sake, I am a living being. I am this conglomeration of cells that is completely differentiated. I'm alive and the awe and the wonder and the just amazement of the fact that I exist at all is what is inside of that character four, that connection, that expansive openness connection to all that it is, the energy of what I am. And so when it comes to healing, it obviously happens in the huddle up. When it comes to healing some aspect of someone's life, maybe someone is too free flighty and, and, and available all the time. And they have this beautiful experience of life, but they have a, a really tough time showing up consistently to their job or to, you know, defining a, 
divining a relationship or hanging on to something that is um, it is accountable, you know, for for others to be able to depend upon or the opposite. Let's say someone is so incredibly um, accountable. They come in, they do like, is the sun going to rise today? This person is going to show up. It's going to be consistent. It's going to be rational. It's going to be logical. They're going to make decisions in a way that that is very dependable in that way. But each each of those two options of, of an individual, and I'm giving painting some extremes, um, it feels somewhat um, shortchanged in life, not fulfilled, or they're not healing on a physical level or an emotional level or a mental level. Or they don't feel um, the spiritual wholeness that is available to them as we sit here and describe it. What would you suggest that someone do? What's the huddle look like? No, the huddle really is all about whole brain living, because what you described is exactly right. If any of these four characters is taking the bone and running with it, then your short circuit, we, we have all four. We are biologically designed to use all four. And based on whatever happens in our past that we end up with the programming that we each end up, whether we're more uh, uh, in the present moment, creative and open, but everything is a chaos. And so I can't really function in my life. Or if everything in my life is so structured and organized that there's no creativity or interest uh, other than that is bigger than what is black and white and right here, right now, the ultimate goal is whole brain living. How do we then really allow these characters moment by moment to have a conversation and say, how do we create balance in our lives? How do we, how do we allow each of these four parts of ourselves to grab the microphone and become their own exquisite expression of who and what we are as living beings and allow each of our each piece of ourselves to speak and to be heard in our own unique way and when we allow ourselves to come together and all four characters communicate with one another then we get to live a balanced life and when we have that level of balance that's when we have not just mental health and brain health Health, mental health based on the brain health, but then we also have the insight into where is the pain. This is not at all about stepping to the side of our pain, but it's it's allowing pain to be a communicator. Okay, if I'm experiencing emotional pain or a spiritual pain or even a physical pain, allowing that pain to bring my awareness that there is something that needs the attention of all parts of me in order to be able to come in, hear that, nurture that, heal that, and then expand as a whole human being. Mm -hmm. And so what is the role of love in this mix? Well, isn't love everything? <laughs> you know, when, uh, when I lost that left hemisphere and I lost the details and I lost Jill Bolte Taylor and I lost my history and I lost my future and I didn't even know what a mother was, what I gained in the absence of all of those details in the external was this incredible sense and feeling of love, of being a part of everything, everything connected in this positive nature of, oh my gosh, the wonder and the beauty that we all are. And to be able to come from that place and, you know, one of the things, Sue, about these four characters is that we all have all four. We're neuroanatomically designed to have all four. And that character four that is the connection, the energy connected to the expansive and openness with an open heart and just this incredible sense and feeling of love. That's the blue sky that's always there. And then consider the cells of character three and the cells of character two and the cells of character one, each one adding a new level of consciousness on top 
of that blue skies, like the clouds coming in or a storm blowing through or whatever weather metaphor you want to look at. But it is that love that is just always there. And I truly believe that that's what we stem from and that's what we return to and that it's always there. And we can quiet that left hemisphere enough to really touch that magnificent beauty of what life is, not just our life, but the life of every human and every life force power in this on this planet. And when we allow ourselves to be in relationship with all life, then that's when we find peace. And it is in that peacefulness that we really do find mental health. Mm-hmm. And, and love is able to rise in our lives when when that harmonizing happens in, inside the huddle. If, if all of the four characters are aware of the four characters, I'm assuming right. that, that you're referencing that as whole brain balance where right brain and left brain are collaboratively allowing for something greater than our, our mind alone to, to be representing our presence here, that there's more to us than just our mind. And that that essence is able to rise and express when we have harmony in the brain. But so many researches are saying, projects are showing that that this left brain is overriding so much of our lives that that we are squelching out our ability to have compassion and to and to sense and to feel loving about things that are occurring in, in this world at this time when there is so much discordant energy happening in the world. There's so much going on and people are enraged by it or they're upset and fearful of it because of it and uh, really accentuating even more left brain activity. So what would you recommend in today's world that we can do to allow for this harmonizing to happen more readily, more consistently, so that so that we don't allow the unkind actions of another to stir unkind actions in us to just contribute to the problem and can really have a strong foothold on how to be the solution instead of becoming part of the problem in our world today. You know, you're absolutely right. We are so skewed as a society to the dominance and predominance of the value structure of that left hemisphere. And when you look at those two hemispheres, the beauty of the 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 two of them is that the right hemisphere takes a group of cells and then it goes to more cells and then they go to more cells and then they go to more cells. So at a biological level, they're actually designed to become more expansive and more open. And this is really necessary if, you know, we have children and we're out on the plains and we got to keep track of all all the children and know what our space is, what it, what is what is around us. And then the left hemisphere comes in and the group of cells go to fewer cells and fewer cells and fewer cells. So they are actually at a cellular biological structure designed to focus in on detail. Well, that's great if that's if we're going to be an engineer or we want to be a mechanic or we want to be, you know, all these detail, detail and more details about those details. And the thing about these two hemispheres then in the way they look at life is that the right hemisphere is it's open and expansive because it's not about me, the individual, then I reach out with compassion and openness because there is no separation between you and me or anyone else. We are one big energy field. We are one human family in relationship with one another in relationship to this beautiful planet where the left hemisphere then comes in and says, I, I am an individual. My life is all about me. It's about my past. It's about my future. My values are how do I get higher on a hierarchy so that my house is bigger. My, I, my bank accounts are bigger. It's more me, me, me. So that's one of the fundamental differences between those two hemispheres. But the other fundamental difference is that that the left hemisphere is actually designed to look at you, character two, that left emotional tissue. It is designed to look out as me, the individual, and it is looking for familiar and it feels safe 
in the presence of that which is familiar. So it's looking for people who have the same skin color, who have the same eye color, who eat the same kinds of foods. And because they eat the same kinds of foods, they have the same kinds of spices and they smell the same. And we speak the same language. And so it's kind of me and mine. And then it becomes a me and mine versus a they and those, and they're different and push it away. While the right hemisphere is actually that character three emotional system is looking also for that which is familiar, that which is different, but that which I can then look at with curiosity. So then if I see someone who has a different skin color, then I'm attracted toward that because I know they're different from me and I want to learn from them. And so, so the two hemispheres are, are opposites in how they process information. So I'm going to take this right back to the first thing you said, and that is we are these biological creatures that is our our perception of ourselves in relationship to other is all based on this filtering and it is these these two two parts of our brain filtering completely opposite and so then it's like okay well then if I know that about my brain and now I see someone who's different from me and I can feel a part of me go oh that person's different from me normally I would say mm, I'm going to push away from that person and then but it's like no it's okay I'm safe. I'm okay. I'm going to go toward that person. And I'm actually going to exercise circuitry inside of my brain that I don't usually exercise. And since cells are simply cells and every ability we have is constantly about cells running in circuit, one of the beautiful things about cells and circuit is the more we run a certain circuit, the stronger that circuit becomes, and then it begins to run on automatic. And then this is how we develop our new habitual thinking. So we have the ability to actually choose who and how we want to be. And I can change my behaviors in over the next month, and I'll have completely different patterns, response patterns, I get to choose who I want to be. Gee, I mean, we are so much more powerful over who and how we are in the world than we've ever been taught. Mm, definitely. One of the things that I do in working with patients and clients uh, to allow for a harmonizing of their system is to really try to get them to see that all of their emotions are equal. They're all of equal value that all emotions are inputs. They're all information that is rising up through our system and arriving at our brain's awareness. And we've developed prejudices against certain emotional states and we have preferences to other emotional states. And because of that, we're always trying to avoid certain conditions that might give rise to certain emotional states that we don't like. But everything is energy, including us. And so if we're constantly marginalizing 50%, let's say, of our energies because we don't like them, then we're actually creating a prejudice that causes the left brain to override the right brain, which is you know, allowing for so much of this, 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 this truth and this wholeness to surface this connection to the cosmos and this universal truth that I am a part of becomes marginalized because we're so busy controlling our environment so that we can only have these certain experiences. And then we want to know why we don't feel whole and complete. And it's because we've been pushing parts of ourselves away all the time. So what you're saying about about recognizing a value system that perhaps needs to be readjusted, I completely concur with. I just agree with it. I love the fact that you're, you're speaking about these things because as we begin to allow ourselves to be present with any emotion and be present with it without running from it or deflecting it or diffusing it or suppressing it again, we can actually become more and more free, which causes us to jump into fight or flight or freeze less often. And, and when we're doing that less often, we actually become creative. We actually become able to tap our genius instead of spending all of our energy just running from the things that we don't want to feel. So is there anything that you can suggest in addition to this um, to, to aid people's ability to learn to become present with themselves and their feelings and the things that are rising in them, because our society has not been trained to do that. 
we were raised in an environment and beliefs were handed down and circumstances and prejudices and all of these types of things are, we're swimming in, in that sort of soup. And so how can we emerge as a whole brain individual when we're just so indoctrinated into another way of being? You know, I love that. I just absolutely love that. It's so true. All emotions are absolutely equal. Absolutely. And what I see is all emotions, all thoughts, all behavior patterns, everything is these magnificent cells and it's energy. So I think of whenever I feel any kind of emotion, to me, I, I can actually visualize my little character too, whether I'm, I'm laughing my butt off and I'm just like exuding joy, or if I am in, in deep physical pain or deep emotional grief, whatever it is, this is energy and it's energy running on cells. And as soon as I, I, I don't want to say reduce myself to that because I value it so deeply, but simply by knowing that every emotion I'm experiencing is energy focused on cells running in circuits, then I get to observe and not simply engage in the pain of it. And as soon as I do that, in that awareness, I'm still standing in the presence of my own being and in my own wellness. And I'm holding myself in this energy. So, you know, to me, it, we're just, it all, it, it all goes down to these beautiful cells running in circuits, paying attention to what am I experiencing? What am I feeling? What are my thought patterns? Do I want more of it? If I want more of it, turn it on, engage in it more. If I, if it is, if, if I want something different then to really begin to explore the present moment because the present moment it's always right here right here right now and for me the huddle the brain huddle the awareness of all four characters is going to be in the present moment in the present moment i call on each of these four characters inside of myself and i celebrate oh my gosh i'm alive character four is just like on fire constantly i woke up today every morning when i first woke wake up. It's like the first thought I have is, oh my gosh, I'm awake again. I'm going to have another at least moment, you know? And then I wonder, well, you know, is today a day I die? And I'm good with that because whatever it is, it's exciting and interesting because whatever is is. And if I'm good with whatever is, then I don't have to worry about my left brain saying, oh my God, did she really say that? It's like, yeah, she really did. Because it's like, well, why wouldn't I be? Why wouldn't I be filled with gratitude and celebration of the life I've lived and the life that I have and the life that I've created for myself? And boy, if I get another moment, wow, how exciting is that? And if I don't, wow, look at what I had. The rest of you need to have a party. <laughs> so, you know, I think that that you celebrating life is so is so um, on the surface of your being uh, because you've had you've had a, a very near death experience, right? You've, you've, you've looked at life in the face and recognized that it could be, it could be slipping away as you were witnessing it happening, as you were aware that this stroke was happening all those years ago. And, and for some that have not been in such extreme circumstances, it, that point of relativity isn't, isn't quite so poignant. And so what can you suggest for people to find that sense of, of joy, you know, I have I have access to that same joy because of reaching exalted states of consciousness through meditation and awakening to this higher realm where uh, we're not confined to the thinking mind and and the body per se. And so uh, I have access to this this be this great beauty and appreciation of life and form. Um, Many people have had neither a stroke and or a near death experience, nor an exalted experience in consciousness through meditation. And and many people are struggling, especially at this time, which I think is these times are an invitation for us to awaken um, to these very things that we're speaking about, because the apple cart has been upset. And so we're we're rearranging and stirring. But what would you suggest for people to be able to find this 
this surfacing of this beautiful character four, this beautiful presencing of, uh, of our divine selves, our whole selves. Uh, if someone is struggling to find that um, within their own daily life experience. Well, I, I want to go, I've got, I've got to go back to cells because that's what I do. So uh, for me, um, two fundamental things. One is what you look for, you will find. If you look for red, you're going to find red everywhere. If you look for reasons to be joyful, you will find reasons to be joyful. If you bring your mind into the present in the present, there is no experience of the past. The, the pain from the past can really be this incredible weight. And I am in absolutely no way saying that does not have value. It has incredible value. And the value of the trauma from our past is that it brings our mind to it, but it's not designed to be a lifestyle. Trauma is designed to give us insight into how we can grow. And so it's important to have that. But if we can lift ourselves into the present moment, look at the face of a baby. Why is it when we look at the face of a baby, oh my gosh, we become infantile and open and loving. It's because there's this presence about them. How do we bring our hearts and our minds into the present and look for, look for the present, look for ways of allowing yourself to exist in the present moment. In the present moment, there is no past, there is no future, there's no fear from the past, pain from the past, no fear of the great unknown. It's just the right here, right now. And whatever we focus on will grow. So if we allow ourselves to run these little moments, look throughout the day for the little pieces of reasons why I could possibly be happy and look at, watch my my own circuitry and how do I worry about things or how do I how do I how do I minimize things how how can I allow myself so now I'm gonna have to throw this right back at you because you do this for a living I just live it but you practice <laughs> it and teach it so you tell me Dr. Sue <laughs> you know it it is uh it is exactly that you know, what I do is bring people into the heart space and allow them to recognize that, the, that, that there is a brain in our gut and there's a brain in our heart and there's a brain in our head. And that ultimately we want these three brains to be speaking to each other, that we are receiving billions of bits of information as a sensory being from the outer world every millisecond. And, and our gut translates that into, uh, into neurotransmitters, into uh, nerve impulses, into energetic uh, risings, and it comes to the filter of the heart and the heart has brain cells in it as well, which is, you know, phenomenal uh, discoveries of science in recent decades. And that then uh, gives rise to what has heart and meaning to us. And when we allow the heart to be involved, it has a, a balancing and harmonizing effect on the brain in our head. And so, and so it's, it's really the same thing that we're speaking about, that it's about presencing. It's about being in this present moment when we're present and our thinking mind isn't doing its thing and it slows down, then our true essence can rise and we can have an experience of this character four. we can have an experience of this present moment and it allows joy to rise up through our system in a way that it just wasn't able to before if our logic, rational thinking mind that is constantly referencing the past and calculating the future um, is in the way. We just simply don't get to have those vibrational experiences of, of love and joy as we are intended to. So we, are, we speak the same, just different languages, and we arrive at the same, the same place in this way. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful thing. I, I, I so appreciate what you're, what you're bringing to the world uh, with your voice because energy medicine and, and th meaning thinking in terms of healing through energetics and looking at the body as, as a system of energies that is supposed to be integrated and working together is something that, that has been my whole life. And, and when, when neuroscientists are turning their attention in this way, such as yourself and bringing this conversation forward, I truly feel that it is going to bring a sense of wholeness to science that, that science has somewhat been missing out on uh, in, in terms of integration and, and really al allowing for whole brain living and whole, whole mindfulness 
to be uh, valued in, in our culture. So I have so many things that I could ask you and say and share, and this is, this is so about you. I also want to make sure that we give uh, some moments to the audience to be able to ask you some questions because you know that's why we're here. And uh, so let's turn that over. Chris, if you can translate any questions for us from our community that is engaged here this, at this time, that would be fabulous. Thank you both. This has been a fascinating uh, conversation. And we do uh, have some questions. I have a, a question, which Dr. Sue, you've been talking to Dr. Jill about. Um, and obviously, for you, Dr. Sue, many of the people that you work with, they're seeking a higher purpose. They're trying to understand. They want to change their lives. And you were talking about the uh, discordant energy that we're seeing in our world. And uh, you know, it seems so much worse, partly because of uh, everything is in front of us through social media and the news, 24-hour news cycle. We see everything that's happening. So these principles and these ideas that you're working with and what you're talking about, Dr. Jill, how do we, on a social and cultural level, how do we translate that to the people who don't even know they're looking for something? They're just lost. And because they're lost, they're acting out or they are so polarized. You know, how do we take the work that you're doing and, and have it make a difference to a broader part of the population? You know, that's that's the exact perfect question of, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. And I look at some of the, the polarity that's going on. And instead of looking at the other person with compassion and understanding that they believe what they believe because they are a biological creature programmed to be thinking the way they think or doing the, the things they wanna do, a lot of us are coming in and shaming each other. And so, you know, if, if I come to you and I'm different from you and I don't offer you sympathy or compassion or openness, then how on earth are we ever going to connect with one another? And so when I meet people who are in any kind of, of hostility or, uh, you know, and right now the whole world seems to be on fire, people are erupting at each other over the vegetables, you know, I can certainly tip for tat for you or I can recognize that you're a person and you're in pain. And if I recognize that you're in pain and that you're acting out your pain, then I can certainly jump into my pain and come back in. I can come in with my, my left rational thinking brain and I can, I can say mean things to you or in, uh, you know, let you know how inappropriate you are, or I can actually just hold the space for you. Um, so I, I recognize I'm not responsible for you, but I am responsible for the energy I bring into any space. And so, so to me that, and I, I truly believe that the more of us who actually come in loving and supportive uh, and compassionate instead of in our own reactivity, my reactivity, when the brain moves into reactivity, it's in its own discordance. It is not in its own natural flow with itself. So if I can hold the space for you, so while you're discordant and help bring you into a harmonizing energy flow, then you can calm and then we can actually stand a chance at communication. So it's really not about the other guy. It really is about me, each one of us as individuals. If I take responsibility for what's going on inside of my brain and you take responsibility for what's going on inside of your brain, we may not always get it right, but at least we're on the same page of trying. And so to me, that's what whole brain living is about. How do we get to know which portions of our brain are strong and stable? What are our choices in any moment? So that if any of us move into that discordant portion of ourselves where our pain is raging, then the rest of us can kind of hold that space. Thank you. Dr. Sue, do you have anything you want to add? You know, when, when I'm in a scenario and, and around folks that aren't really interested in, don't even, they're not even involved in a conversation about personal development or, you know, awakening or, or really becoming more masterful at life. They're just living, they're just doing their thing. And they, if they get into the discordant conversation about the discordant energies that are, you know, on the surface of the planet at this time, um, I oftentimes will just ask them, what are you 
what are you learning about yourself during these times? What is it, what's it, what's it teaching you about you these times, you know, the struggle, the strain, and rather than just keeping the conversation on the level of the conflict or the debate of the issues or who's right and who's wrong or who do we believe or what's happening, but to really like turn it toward the individual and say, you know, it's, it's amazing. And they say that, you know, it's all happening for a reason. Uh, what are you learning? What is it teaching you? What's it drawing forth in you these times, you know, and, and just allow them to become a little bit more internally reflective. And just by turning the brain into the mind toward this internalization of, of like, wow, who am I in the face of all of this? It starts the process of really waking up to who I am and how I'm navigating these circumstances of, of the story in, in it for humanity at this time. And when people start thinking in those terms, they get less involved out in the out there and they get more aware of what's happening in here. And we automatically start to become part of the solution instead of part of the problem. We become more reflective and we become more, uh, more heartfelt in our decisions. And when we become more aware of how we feel and what's, what it's serving in us to be in these times, uh, we start to approach the next conversation from a slightly different perspective. The filter starts to get polished and refined and there's more clarity coming through that really allows this huddling up of what Dr. Jill is speaking about to happen. We're not overriding it and getting our warrior on and getting out there and getting angry back at the people who are so angry. We're, we're realizing that, that, wow, you know, I have some awareness here that more of the same isn't going to serve. And so I might not be in a program of personal development or awakening or self-healing, but, but just by having a conversation from a deeper place, we start to spread this presence of presencing ourselves in the midst of turmoil. So hopefully that's Thank helpful. You. I think it's been, uh, you know, it, it's been exacerbated, obviously, over the last two years if we think of social environments, school, for some people, church, for some people, family activities, where they learn certain behaviors and they learn to think. And with the lack of interaction, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's just made it more difficult, particularly for young people, uh, to, to find their place and to understand what they're looking for. We have a question from Randy, and he asks, other than instincts, instincts which are shared by all humans, can you talk about what parts of the brain inherit anything, including the fears or other senses from ancestors, and how is it best to tap into this, if so? Um, okay, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I can certainly give you a neuroanatomical answer. Um, so when you think about the brainstem region of the human brain, uh, so you're going to have the spinal cord coming up and then you're going to have the brain stem and you're going to have a thalamus in here. And these are going to be a lot of um, on off yes no uh, responses from reptiles. That's the reptilian brain. Um, I'm hungry. I eat. I'm not hungry anymore. I'm thirsty. I drink. I'm, uh, my brain tells me I, I don't need to drink anymore, et cetera. And then on top of that gets added the new tissue of the emotion. And the emotion is, is the difference difference between the mammalian brain and the reptilian brain. So we end up with this limbic tissue on top. So it, when you think about what is inherited, we inherited so many different levels. We can, we can inherit at a genetic level with genes being atoms and molecules uh, in pattern motion at the level of our DNA and the complexity of everything that we're learning of that, but we also learn pattern responses at the level of the cells. So that it's, uh, as I started out, it's a hard question because it's so diverse in what is going on. And if there are energetic patterns that were going on inside of my mother when I was in her womb or when I was in my mother's ovary, when she was in my grandmother's womb, then you know these dynamics of what is inherent uh, and instinctive get pretty complicated. 
Sue, what are you going to say about that one? Yeah, so it is a big topic and a wonderful, wonderful exploration. You know, the the distinctions between the brain and the mind kind of come into into focus that that, you know, research is showing us that that we have with the power of focusing the mind, we have the power to restructure our inherited tendencies. We have the the power to turn on and turn off different telomeres in the DNA molecule. So we might've inherited a certain pattern of sequences, but we have the power if we awaken to that power to change which telomeres are turning on and which are turning off. And this is the study of epigenetics. And so inside of the study of epigenetics, we recognize that our our energetic environment is more important than our genetic inheritance when it comes to what we will have to live out in this world, what we will have to live through, that we can transmute or transform that with with learning how to master the mind in such a way that it creates a different environment so that these little antennas on the surface of the cells of our body receive different information, relay different information to the intracellular environment, which then relays different information up through neurotransmitters and chemical impulses, et cetera, that ever arrive at the brain. And so it's a fascinating study when we start putting it all together. But basically what science is showing us is that we have the power, in fact, are encoded with the capacity to transform what we inherited. And that just because our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents and so forth had a a, a tendency toward um, a, a disease condition, diabetes, cancer, whatever it is, doesn't mean that we have to express that. There are many people walking around with a with a tendency toward it, but they're not living in the expression of it because they're creating enough of an environment energetically and, and biochemically that their, their telomeres are not being activated in such a way that it's expressing as a disease condition in their life. So it's kind of fascinating when we really look into how it all fits together and the power that we have to truly change change who we thought we were and who we used to study that we were destined to be based upon our genetic inheritance. It turns out through the studies of epigenetics that uh, and this new biology that is on the forefront uh, for humanity, um, that it, it wasn't the whole truth. It wasn't incorrect. It was just incomplete information. And the more we learn, the more we can share this power that we have to to train, to change and transform uh, what our current circumstances are physically, mentally, emotionally and environmentally. So thank you. Well, we're out of time. This has been a fascinating conversation. Obviously, we could go on and we can find a new conversation to have in the future. I want to thank you both for your time and for all the work that you're doing. I want to thank our audience for participating tonight. I hope you'll join us next week for our program with Bobby Kaler on Am I Showing Up in All the Roles That Are Important to Me? And I wish everybody a good night. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank Thank you, you, Dr. Jill. Thank you. Dr. Jill, enjoy the enjoy that time on the boat. Thank you. And um, right. And thanks, thanks so much. And uh, Dr. Sue, I know you've got to get to a, another workshop class tonight. So yes. really appreciate you taking this moment out of your four day workshop to share Absolutely. with us. We really appreciate it. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Thank you, and thank you, Jill, so much. It's always a beautiful delight to be with thank you. you. So Good night. thank you, right. thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.